Um, welcome to our convocation this afternoon, to all of you. Um, our guest this afternoon for the convocation is um, a friend of the seminary who we've been getting to know over the last couple of years, um, Pastor Phil Gagnon from St. Albert Lutheran Church. And um, he's here to speak to us this afternoon about the North American Lutheran Church, uh, with which he is very much affiliated and in which he's very much involved as a provisional dean. I'm not quite sure what the provisional part is, but um, one of the leaders that is of the Canadian churches that are part of the North American Lutheran Church. Um, and I don't want to say too much more about that, partly because I'm rather ignorant about the details, but also because that's what he's here to speak to us about this afternoon. Um, Pastor Phil uh, attended King's College here in Edmonton and from there um, went to seminary at uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary in um, Saskatoon. He attended there from 1993 to 1997, and his first parish was Golden Valley Lutheran Church in Viking. Um, he was there for five years, which is, I would say, a shortish stay, but kind of average for first parishes. Um, it was also five years in my first parish, <laughs> so that's not a bad thing. Um, and he's been at St. Albert Lutheran Church now since 2002 in his second parish. Um, along the way, he's been involved in many other ministries and adjunct things and extensions of his normal congregational service. And again, if you want to talk about that, we'll leave that up to you. Um, he's married to Patricia, um, has been since 1985. They have three grown children. And we're very glad to uh, welcome you here today to speak to us. Um, we're here till about 2.30 or so. Um, for everybody's sake, always good to establish that parameter right off the bat. Um, and we welcome you and uh, look forward to what you have to share with us. So, welcome, so, Pastor Phil. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me here today and to have this opportunity. Um, I'm very informal when I speak, when I do these kinds of presentations. Please. Feel free to ask questions at any time. In fact, I feel more comfortable when you ask questions because then, since we only have an hour and a half, uh, so to you know, to talk, uh, to share it together, uh, sometimes we cover more ground when we ask questions, so we can, you know, do that along the way. So I'm going to do this completely off the cuff, so to speak, uh, because uh, frankly, it just just that's just the way I roll. Um, <laughs> anyway, to talk about the NALC, the North American Lutheran Church. Um, the, I became first involved in the North American Lutheran Church about three years ago, uh, actually about four years ago now. The time's gone very quickly. I was a, the chairperson, um, my, my partner in crime, Carl Johnson, and I have been involved doing all sorts of things for the last 17, 15 years in ministry, uh, from doing apologetics within the life of the LCIC, vis-a-vis -vis their stand in revisionism, homosexuality, issues like that. And so there's been kind of a, a trajectory, you might say, um, in terms of within the LCIC and then toward the formation of the MELC, uh, the North American Lutheran Church. Um, and so uh, we were involved with the Confessional uh, uh, Lutheran Fellowship. Dr. Arnold Hagen and George Evenson had asked Carl and I to take over that when they, they felt that it was time for them to move on, so to speak. And um, then that later on became the Confessional Ministerium, about 55 pastors uh, that I was chair of and Carl was vice chair. And uh, then we became involved with all the other renewal movements within North America, within the LCA and the LCIC specifically. And so we began meeting together and talking. We also began meeting too, roughly about five years ago, or around the same time as the now because uh, that's where I met Ed. And we met the first time in Calgary, I believe, yep. in Denny Cochran. And we, as a confessional ministerium, was talking to the LCC, to uh, the brothers uh, in Christ. Uh, down there and talking, how can we work together? Well, how can we support? And we were, and still are, very grateful to the LCC and the LCMS for their support and their walking beside us as we went through these struggles in the LCIC and the LCA. So we began talking and sharing and to see what Christ is, is, is doing uh, in his church, with his people. So that was kind of around the same time, roughly, when we were meeting with the LCC, that we began coming together as renewal groups down in the States. And um, the last meeting I was at, because things just got busy and whatnot, and Carl was voted on to the Lutheran Core Steering Committee, and I was still chair of the Christian Ministerium. Uh, the last one I was at was in Indianapolis in January, about three years ago. And I was just before uh, Fisher's uh, Grove down in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, 
where um, the formation of uh, Van Elk began. And there it was a, a wonderful uh, meeting of, of, of like-minded people, confessional minded people. He came together and uh, decided, uh, you know, it, was, it was an organic thing to create the North American Lutheran Church. And so from that point on, more, you know, you know, getting together, uh, you know, hammering out constitutions, all those kinds of things, working together, praying together, walking together, all the things that make up creating a church. And so uh, two years ago was the official, you know, convocation, and uh, so we've been growing ever since. So um, the now uh, they like us to say the NALC uh, rather than I, I always say, have you got NALC? Uh, substance and taste. Anyway, uh, <laughs> maybe it's just a Canadian thing, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so the NALC uh, has been growing, um, and maturing, you know, much like a teenager, you know, uh, into its role uh, as another North American Lutheran church. Very, I think, uh, and, and I'm speaking out of my own um, experience here, obviously, um, growing into its own. Uh, it's more of a centrist confessional, very orthodox, very conservative. Um, you know, there's differences, of course, we could talk about some of those kinds of things, but, uh, but very, very close together. I mean, which is why the LCC, LCMS, and the NALC, uh, we've got to make up some sort of kind of another way of saying LCMS, like limuses. Um, <laughs> anyway, we are, we've been in conversation ever since the beginning, uh, and that's been very good. Um, I mean, I, I, you may or may not know that. Uh, your body, the LCC, uh, voted about a year ago to uh, to allow us, the CALC and the NALC, to become part of the Health and Dental Pension Funds, which is a, a wonderful gift. Uh, just, it's You don't know, understand how much this means to us, because it is a tremendous amount of work to do all these kinds of things, and to have another Lutheran body walk beside us and then to, to invite us in, in, to, to do this is just is tremendous. So we are very, very grateful as the NALC, uh, and also sure the CALC is for that too. Um, so, uh, the NALC uh, has been growing, maturing uh, in uh, relationships within itself, without, uh, in terms of ecumenical relationships uh, with the, uh, your bodies, and also too uh, with other bodies, too, with the Federation, uh, we have an um, uh, application we were invited to by our African brothers and sisters to become part of that, uh, to walk with them in the Lutheran Federation, to become a presence there as well. And um, so that's been very good. Uh, we've been um, also growing within too. There's a lot of growing pains when you begin a, uh, a new thing. Um, my own position, for instance, is provisional dean. Provisional dean means that I'm provisional. <laughs> the, the, uh, the last study conference we had down in Canberra, which I invite you to come, it, it'll be a great time. Um, you know, I'm gonna be myself on this thing, so wherever this thing goes on YouTube, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, so I'm going to say it this the way I know how to say it. It's going to be good theology, good fellowship, and good beer. So yeah, I know it's, it's good. Um, we know there's a God. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it, it's a, we, doctor, we have Dr. Uwe Simonetto coming to speak to us and then respond to Dr. Walter Sundberg. And it's time. Last year we had 14 Lutheran bodies represented. Uh, we grew by 40 percent the first year, and because our goal in Canada is to have uh, in Canmore the best Lutheran theological conference we can have. Uh, but to have it the, the fun, is to put the fun back into funny. Uh, or, I was gonna say fundamental, but that's not correct either. Uh, but anyway, we want it to be that place where we have exactly like I said, good theology and good fellowship. And one of the things that came up again and again and again when we had the study conference that we invite you to, um, was a comment that it didn't matter where you sat, you were accepted. And uh, when we were going through the LCAC, and I'm sure my brothers and sisters in the LCA, there was places you were not accepted uh, because you were confessional or you were conservative or you just had a different way of expressing your faith in Christ. So it wasn't always good. So down in Canmore, it's a, it's a good place. You know? I would almost say warm, welcoming and accepting, but that's almost been, the language has been co-opted by other groups, but it is exactly that. So I invite you to come. So um, we've been growing in that aspect, um, providing that theological conference in Canada, inviting all of North America to come, and that's been going well. So in terms of the NALC, because I contend, I, you may not have guessed it by now, but I probably have ADD, so I'm all over the place. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the NALC. We are Christ-centered. We are congregationally focused. Uh, uh, we are traditionally grounded, and we are mission-oriented. Those are our four main values. Uh, we believe uh, in, in proclaiming and holding to the great tradition of the church, which I believe the Luther uh, very much exemplified. 
as a as a uh, he's a Catholic, right? Maybe not a Roman Catholic, but certainly a Catholic, a, a Christian holding to that. As he once said, as our church fathers have once taught us, um, you know, we're not inventing anything new here. So, um, though there's always room for conversation, right? Which is why there's different bodies. Um, so the NALC. Um, is, uh, is very much those four things. They're focused on these four areas, our four values. Uh, we're also very much um, focused on, on, on growing and, and, uh, and, and uh, developing our relationships with other bodies, uh, Lutheran and otherwise. So uh, um, this is probably a good time for you because I can ramble on about all sorts of different things about the NSC. Do you have any specific questions per se about various roles or structures or things like that? Or do we just go for beer? <laughs> you want to go from here, don't you? Yes, <laughs> yes. beer would be good. <laughs> yeah. While we're yeah. having beer, we can ask, I yeah. ask this question. Um, with the, uh, your, your professionalism and the, the work you're doing, is it both Canada and U.S. together? Or is there, um, is there kind of a distinction between the Canada contingent and the U.S. contingent? Or is it very much just one body, North America kind? Of? Well, you know Canada is a, another country. Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, to answer that question, it's called the North American. This is a, the Lutheran Church within North America, not a not a Canadian Lutheran Church versus an American or working alongside an American Lutheran Church. We 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 hope we we aspire to being a Lutheran Church in North America, and also there's been churches in various other places that have asked us, you know, though we would have to change our name, like from Russia, wanting to be more part of the NAL season. Yeah, it's, it's, it would just call ourselves a worldwide Lutheran church, I guess, but uh, but the Caribbean as well, too, and, and uh, what I'm wanting. So it's a North American Lutheran church. Canada, of course, has its own distinctives. We are a different country, but we're not that not much different. You know, we may have a better sense of humor. <laughs> I think, anyway, sometimes. <laughs> At least that's what I say. But, uh, and no, we, we're, we're very similar. Um, and we're finding that out of myself. Some of the fears sometimes with some of the congregations being, you know, well, the Americans will take us over kind of thing. And that's not my experience at all. There's been tremendous respect for the Canadian Lutherans and uh, what they have to offer within the North American Lutheran Church. It's been just uh, overwhelming the, the appreciation of the Canadian section. We, right now, we are the Canada section because we are another country. The only thing that makes us different, per se, in terms of ministry is the fact that we, we're in another country with different tax laws. So in terms of finances, something, you know, that kind of, you know, um, was it left-hand kingdom stuff, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a... It's a different matter. But ministry-wise, we hold to the same theology. We can work together. Uh, in terms of mission districts, congregation that may be a close along the border. Right now we have 21 congregations in Canada. So as we grow and, and we keep getting dribs and drabs congregations, because well, we'll talk about that later on maybe, in terms of the process of leaving the ELC, I see what that's meant for congregations. But because of that process, we see congregations coming in once in a while. Sometimes you have three or four, one or two, then maybe one after a while, but it's coming along. Like there's another four or five that's in process now various stages of process. Um, so um, as those congregations, you know, um, become established, maybe along the border, then mission districts can overlap the borders. We can work together in ministry without necessarily having to share all the same kinds of, you know, concerns regarding tax laws and you know, giving and all that kind of stuff. So we are one church. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yes, sir. Within um, Canada, um, are the uh, NALC congregations uh, regionally concentrated anywhere, or is it just kind of a sprinkling? We're, yeah, we're pretty much our constant. We have one in northern British Columbia. We have, uh, I believe, 16 in, uh, let's see if this adds up here, to 21. Uh, we have, uh, we have um, one in Saskatchewan, three in Winnipeg, so that's five. And so we have 16 uh, in Alberta. And we have interest, uh, I just had a conversation with somebody else in Saskatchewan, and I've had conversations with one in Ontario, another one in Lower Mainland BC, and there's two other mission plants that are percolating, just put it that way. <laughs> you know, and, and, and as things develop, and as other congregations hear about what's going on, what's possible, a lot, we're, we're very much isolated, we're a big country. And so a lot of the questions are, so, ooh, where's the next now congregation, or whatever. We're all over the place. And so that's part of our our growing edge, our struggle, is, is, is communication, uh, supporting each other, all that kind of stuff. You know. Well, what I can say too, in terms of the structure um, of the NALC, people back and forth between saying that, uh, NALC now, is um, we have one bishop uh, for all of North America. We have one 
um, general secretary. And the bishop's role is to be, as the confessions talk about, the defender of the faith, the teacher of doctrine, the pastor to the pastors, the one who's a spiritual guide and leader for the church. Of course, not above, he's not the pope, right? You know, or pontiff or anything else like that. Um, he very much, uh, Bishop Rudowski, very much uh, works with um, the assistants and, and everybody else. Uh, you know, the multitude of counselors is wisdom, right? And we have two other assistants, uh, Gimachus Buba and uh, Dave Wendell. Dave Wendell being uh, the assistant uh, taking care of ecumenical relationships and candidacy, mission plans and stuff, and, and Gimachus for missions, uh, within and without. So he's looking at house church models, things like that. And also, how we do missions in the world. And we have uh, ecumenical relationships with, with many different bodies, uh, mostly with Africa right now. Though we're, we're, we have conversation with well, the Caribbean and Latin America as well too. So, so that's our main body. Of course, we have treasurer, you know, secretary, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, any other questions? We definitely want to take over your churches. That's our goal. <laughs> <laughs> that is a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> Indirect way. <laughs> Just to stir the pot, but ask some question. So, anything else I can answer for you? Yes, Ed. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out since I, I know a bit more than some of the others do because of the conversations that we've had. Right. Um, uh, I know you've got a, a couple of top notch theologians in your group because Jim Nesting and has gone now, because he's not, because I always see his picture with the with the various groups from the talks that are going on in the States. Are there any other well-known, so uh, for example, Broughton and or Jensen become members of now congregations, or are they involved in that? Uh, that's I, a good question. I mean, Broughton has, has bounced around a little yeah. bit. I think most recently he's been in Phoenix. Um, and that's a good question. I never asked you know, Dr. Broughton which congregation he goes to. Oh, he's been so involved with Lutheran Corps and with the sure. NELC that I've assumed huh. that he goes to uh, the last I heard, he was in an ELCA congregation. Okay. Yeah. Still, want, still wants to be the gadfly for the, the, the ELCA and try to keep him honest? I, I think so, to a certain degree, though I think in his last book he can be that clear where he stands there, mm -hmm. you know, in his autobiography. Um, I think Robert Benny, uh, who's a Lutheran ethicist from Roanoke, yeah. Boston, oh, sure. he's, uh, he's a gone to an ELCA, I believe. Uh, we have Paul Henlicky, we have uh, Sarah Henley, Sarah actually knows ELCA. Um, uh, Nathan Yoder. Um, you know, now they actually asked me that question. I'm trying to remember the name. I can see their faces. I can't remember the names. Um, Nessigan, of course. Um, we're, going to, we're going to seduce Uwe Simonetto to join us. Yeah. <laughs> we just got him in Missouri. You don't want to let him go. But that's why he's very fragile right now, you see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him. <laughs> you know, the Grizzly Paul Brewery is next door um, at the Canmore. So, yeah, we, we do have some very good theologians along the way. That, that's, um, yeah. There's actually a whole panel of them. I'm trying to remember all their names. It just we had the young theologians group that met at the restaurant down in Columbus, Ohio. There's like 15 or 16 of them. Of course, depending on what you mean by young, um, yeah. you know, you're not going to find any 30, 40 year olds. I don't think. Well, except for Nathan Yoder. Okay, Amy Schiffer, of course, as well, to for liturgy and homiletics. Yeah. You probably have a better idea if you looked up on the website for all their names. Yeah. yeah. Good. How many congregations are there all together? There's just under 400 congregations. And are those all, are, are they from a variety of Lutheran um, synods or bodies? Mo mostly, you know, like, mostly from the ELCAC and ELCA, uh, though there are some from the Augsburg, that there, there's one Augsburg body that became mission district of on so in the Augsburg church, I'm trying to learn the, the acronym. See, you gotta understand, uh, I'm a Roman Catholic, you know, kind of a convert here a long time ago. So the whole world of, EL, uh, of Lutheran acronyms, you know, escapes me. There's so many, I mean, the church in Canada, there was like 60 different bodies, and there's this kind of this merger, kind of a, something of a chart, more like alphabet soup. So sometimes I forget the actual acronyms, but the Augsburg body, descended from the Swedish body, they, uh, they become part of the NALC. So I think there's like, I'm not even going to hazard a guess. I know it's not a very large body, so I hate to say 21 is 30 or 10 in the congregations. <clears throat> Mostly from the ELCA and the LCSC. You do, you, you do have a few independents that came in, and that's going to happen when you, when you have some of this happen. Usually when this happens in my congregation, I say, well, we have all day. <laughs> 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 Usually that's when you ask a question. 
I know. That's true. <laughs> Nobody's asking me any questions. <laughs> Um, at what point did you know kind of unambiguously that some, you needed to leave to begin a new church body? You know, I, I imagine there are a number of years of struggle, but it, was there a one defining moment or? Mm, that's a good question. And that kind of, I guess that kind of gives us a bit of a segue to the next section, eh? like how we you know, we can go back and forth too. You know, um, when I took my, my call to St. Albert in um, 2002, I had one parishioner who was very um, persistent. He kept saying, when, when are we going to leave the OCIC? And I kept saying, not yet. Because I, I felt there was hope. You know, I felt there was hope that we could, we could push back this, this wave of, of uh, this momentum of revisionism within the church. Um, but then toward the end, obviously, like two years ago, after the, after, you know, the religious movement you know, brought forward the vote uh, for the third time and then pushed it through and shouldn't have done it even the first time because we turned it down. Not necessarily decisively, you know, um, you know, not even 60% or 40, but it was enough, you know, like it was like a 9% difference and then it was like a 6% difference and then there wasn't enough difference, you know, on the third vote. I used to know those stats exactly when I gave a presentation to my congregation as to the poly and the process, right, politically. Um, so as we as we saw more and more of the politics, you know, become controlled by this revisionist group, uh, then we started realizing that yeah, there was no hope. Uh, I mean, there's always hope, I guess, for you know God. I mean, God is always active amongst us, but. Um, you know, the, 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 the pro-gay movement, the revisionist movement within the church was so powerful at the national church level that there was really nothing else we thought that could be done. Almost every single person on, on national church council was, was, was a revisionist. Um, almost all of our bishops, except for Ron Mayen, um, was. Um, and even to the point that our national bishop recently wouldn't even defend the resurrection, you know. Um, we all have opinions, you know. We have unity and diversity. All those little catchphrases that we hear all the time. Um, so I mean, that was around even then. You know, it just wasn't so blatant, outspoken. And then as as we got to the, the vote in 2011, then it became very outspoken and very blatant. So for me, that's that was it. That vote, that that 2011, that, that was the that was the the summer of my discontent. <laughs> you might say I ended up going to Maui for a week because I had to get away because I was basically I felt betrayed by my, my denomination where the church I'd been ordained it to and I don't know if you were there that day Eric when I kind of went off the beam in a sense and, and I went off the beam but I, I, I dissected the bishop uh, um, Johnson's uh, 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 sermon and uh, actually looked at what Matthew 13 actually said when you have a bishop say, that's not what Jesus said, and then you read what Jesus said, and it's the exact opposite to what's being said. And then he actually explains the parable, you know, uh, which is, you know, black to her white kind of thing. Uh, that's just inexcusable, right? And it's certainly not uh, faithful to the gospel, nor to your calling as bishop. And so that, for me, then, that was my decision. I, I had to go away. Of course, my wife said I could go away to Maui. She just didn't really think I would go to Maui. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her on the phone when I left Vancouver. I said, uh, so I'm leaving and I'll be back on this day and I'll be driving home. And I should make it back in one day. I'll leave Vancouver and go to Cocoa Hall next She said, you're not really going, are you? I know you're in a bad mood and things. She goes, yeah, I'm really going. She said, I didn't think you'd really go. I said, my name is Phil. Have we met? <laughs> you, you gave me permission to go. <laughs> you told me I should go, so I did. Anyway, so that for me was my, my decision to leave the LCIC. Um, it was very akin to... to when I left King's College, when the whole thing with Delman Breen, I was talking to Steve about it a little bit before, there was uh, six of us pre-seminary students at King's College. Uh, some of us were Pentecostal, Lutheran, uh, Presbyterian, uh, Christian Reformed. Um, and uh, my last semester, I, I leave because I don't know if you guys remember what happened with Delman Breen, who was a lab instructor, right? That, that, that whole thing went to the Supreme Court of Canada. And we were part of that process, part of that discussion in-house at King's College. and. Um, the pressure upon us students was just outrageous. You know, uh, was, the stress was so much that all the other students left before I did. And I didn't leave until I felt that there was nothing else I could do. 
So I left in January of my last semester. So I had five courses left that I had to do while I was at seminary, which I did by internet. Very stressful year when you do a full year of seminary and another semester on top of that, just so you can get through. So it was not fun. Of course, I'm still one course short, so I think I worked it in anyway, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you had, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was, it was one that there, you know, it was so blatant and so clear, black and white, you might say. When, 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 when the church, you know, can present a motion that says that we'll perform marriages according to the laws of the province, you know, according to motion, I think it was motion two. Um, that's a scary statement because now we've set precedent, not only in our theology, but now that theology is really determined by the laws of the province. That's a scary place to be, you know, um, I think. Because now you've given precedent to the government. And you've given precedent now to our church body that says, well, now we have to basically take society's lead in how we live as, as believers in Christ. And that's not a good place to be. And for it to be, you know, to, to go through in the way that it went through, too. I mean, there's so many stories I could tell you that, and, and some of them are obviously second or third hand. And from my own youth worker who was there who saw certain things that were just so crazy you know, in terms of process that it would, you know, but again, that's second hand, so I can't tell you. That. Suffice yeah. to say that it was not proper. Yeah, just related to that, is the EELCIC statement on sexuality on their website yet? Or it, it was at one time, or at least when I was on our commission, we had copies of it because we did talk about it a bit. Because that's quite enlightening, the procedures that they go through. It's oh, exactly, right. exactly as you say, that it says the culture sets the agenda, basically. Pretty much. Very much so. And, 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 and the scholarship that was done, uh, and I want to say this well so I don't get sued you know, by somebody along the way by accident, but we, uh, Bishop Christensen asked myself and Paul Quist along with Richard Reimer and Christina Martinson to hold the first uh, conference on homosexuality within the Lutheran Church in Canada. So we did that, and I think it was 1998 in Can uh, Camrose. And uh, the scholarship that was presented there by the pro-gay side, the revision side, was so shoddy, it was ridiculous. At one point I asked a professor, uh, one of my ex-professors from seminary, um, why in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, annotation was there, well, there was no annotation. <laughs> For like 40% like of, the, of, the, of the remarks, you know, they weren't annotated. Uh, and there was one particular one that was annotated, but the way it was annotated, I said, you, you, you noted Carl Broughton here, and you said church dogmatics, but I said you didn't say where in church dogmatics. There's 15 volumes to church dogmatics. Uh, and he said, well, I didn't intend this to be scholarly work. And I said, well, you've achieved your goal. Uh, <laughs> because it wasn't very scholarly. And, and so the logic and the lack of theological insight that went into you know, the movement was just scary. You know? we, we were, we were, we were, you know, the revisionist um, way of doing things is, is not by scripture. Um, when I was in Toronto once, I was talking about a, a, a program we had come up with called uh, Communities of Grace. I wanted to, we wrote a, a program talking about um, about the um, uh, reconciling Christ communi uh, uh, communities of oh, was it now? reconciling Christ. It is a program that they have for con congregations. It'll come back to me. I want to see what it would look like if it was actually conservative and orthodox according to scriptures. So we wrote one called Communities of Grace. I was asked to speak, and some of the professors from uh, Waterloo were there, along with Bishop uh, Price. And um, I made a comment. During that, I said, the reason why I think we, don't, we can't talk to each other within the church, the LCC, is because we have a biblical confessional language, but you have a socio-political language. And he said, you're right. So what do you do <laughs> when you acknowledge that, you know, and then you have nothing left to talk about? Which is really sad, you know, because you, you, you know, this is a family that's been broken up. You know, people you know liked each other, loved each other, walked together, and then you find out you don't have the same the same theology, you don't have the same Christ. You know, yeah. so that's a very painful thing. I've got one oh. that, that, that kind of relates to this. Basically, it looks at the histories. When did the wind shift? When did all of this uh, start? Did the church people in the church become aware that things are not what they used to be? Well, it depends on who you talk to, I guess. I mean, again, like, I, I'm a relatively new Lutheran, right? Um, I mean, I started going to Lutheran Church in 1985. Some people would say <coughs> 1986 at the time of the merger. That's when things changed. Huh. You know, that's why CALC began with five congregations. Um, other, words, other words would say it would be in the early 90s. 
when I went to seminary and whatnot, and then things started really changing, and it, you know, not always so obvious illusions in, in classes and things like that about, you know, uh, Christ being the only, you know, uh, the only savior, uh, you know, uh, things like that, the resurrection being only spiritual, not physical either, you know, all sorts of interesting things. So I think in the so safely maybe mid '90s, at least in my mind, and then when it started becoming more, much more openly spoken of, uh, and then political, you know, when things became so politicized, and then uh, in 2005, so nine we missed it was Vancouver. Yeah. So by 2005, when the first vote came out, and then people said, "What? We can't be that. This is kind of crazy." But it happened, you know, and um, yeah. And I hate to say it, I mean, you know, you know, to, to say nothing is to say something. And, and we got what we deserved, in a sense, because when we didn't stand up and we didn't vote for what was orthodox, what was confessional, then we got what we deserved, right? I mean, we vote our politicians in, right? Even when we don't vote, we vote for them. So, yeah, mid-90s, maybe. So well, for us, I mean, we, uh, Carl and I and a number of other confessional ministerium, usual suspects, we, we began, uh, you know, uh, looking to the NALC and making, uh, you know, arrangements with our own con Each congregation is different. We're not all in the same place. We had this ideal that we would stay together or leave together. But that, that's really glossing over the reality that every pastor, every congregation is in a different place. Whether you're urban or rural, you're, you have different needs, different different uh, expectations within your congregation, different realities, financially and otherwise. So how then do you leave together? And how then do you leave or stay together? I mean, it, it was impossible, really. It was ideal. That's about it. And so um, many different congregations started doing um, their own preparations in different ways. We had some pastors leave and come to the LCC. Others went to became independent. Others went to the CALC. Others stayed, like myself, within the, the LCC until we could equip our congregation. In our congregation, I mean, I'd be teaching, not within the sermon time, uh, unless the text demanded it, uh, but afterwards during teaching, during classes, studies on sexuality and theology and whatnot, we would talk about these kinds of things uh, in order to prepare my congregation and to teach and to equip them to understand the issues. So for the year before we left, um, I did a PowerPoint presentation and a teaching, it was about an hour and 15 minutes, and I repeated it three times on the theology of the church. Um, and then we did another three sessions, the same one we did three times, on the process and the politics. How, how did we get here within the life of the LCC? And to basically show chronologically, this is what happened. And this is why the third vote wrote. We had one, this is an aside, during our third, we had three town hall meetings, so where we could talk about it. And uh, one of our meetings, I think it was the last one, one person in our parish was asked a question because she had two or three pastors in her, in her family. And uh, she was asked, why, you know, why did they bring this up for the third time? This, this vote. And um, she said that, that her, her husband's uncles, who were pastors, had said that, well, before uh, they weren't, the EOCC wasn't mature enough to make the right decision. And that's why it was brought forward again and again. Now, that's just her opinion, her uncle's positions. But that seemed to be the prevalent kind of thinking. You know, just got to keep pounding. Of course, that, that's, that's actually part of their strategy within the pro gay movement, though. When you read after the ball, that's part of their, their strategy, just keep pounding away. You'll wear them down like a teenager wanting the car, keys to the car. You know, dad, dad, you know, again and again. And eventually, you get tired. You just get tired. I've seen pastors get tired, congregations get tired. You just kind of roll over and say, you know what, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. And you back off. And then you think you're going to isolate yourself from what's going on. And you don't. Eventually, it catches up to you. So that's what we did for a year. And uh, yeah, I think it worked well. We lost probably about probably about 7% of our congregation, attending congregation, 7 or 8%, about 30 people. And these are all people that I love, I love dearly. I, I had dreams actually for, for a while of one particular person, you know, us coming together over a beer and just talking and saying, you know, I thought this through. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right after all, <laughs> you know. But I cared for this person. This person was, was chairperson of my congregation for four out of the 10 years before he left. Wonderful guy. We get together, research scientist, he said, you know, Phil, I agree with 98% of what you say except for this issue. You know, as a family member, uh, that, you know, that, that, was, that was gay. And uh, I said, you know, if this is the case, you need to reevaluate that 2%. It's highly inconsistent. And we'd have great talks. We'd agree on everything except for this one point. And then all of a sudden, it's as if the world went nuts. 
you know, it became our, our language became much more emotional than theological, you know, less biblical, confessional, much more relational. It was a hard time, so we lost a lot of people that we cared about. Good-hearted, but not on the same page, and, and, and then you really understand where they're coming from theologically, and uh, the point out the window. So it's tough. So each congregation has gone through their own struggles. Yep. Um, yeah. I, building on this part of uh, your story, namely how the congregation got to this point, um, one of the macro issues here within our formation processes is um, thinking through the relationship between pastoral office and ministry of the congregation. Um, how those two relate to one another in theological terms, but also in practical terms. And I'm wondering, um, this, this was part of the re request and interest in having you come and talk about this whole thing, was just um, what did you learn? Um, what have you learned? What has your congregation learned? How have you worked out um, this whole issue in terms of your leadership, their leadership, um, you know, who was pushing, who was pulling, um, how, did, how did you arrive at that decision point um, together as pastor and people? Um, you, know, you mentioned already it's been different in, from this congregation to that one. Different pastors have had different processes, but um, particularly through your experience with your congregation, um, how did that all transpire in terms of that pastor congregation relationship. I'll try to answer all that was, 13 that was, that of those questions. Long, yeah, there, there was a long thing there, but it's, yeah. it's kind of a whole cluster of things that I think this this uh, history you've gone through gives us a lens on. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a long answer. Um, well, basically, I mean, again, I mean, I wasn't isolated in terms of my interest and my concern for the LCIC. Uh, nor for the parish. I mean, like I said before, when I first got there, mm -hmm. I had one person that came to me and said, when are we going to leave? Yeah. Um, and I kept seeing hope. I mean, for a long time, I said, just some glimmer of hope, you know. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so there's many others along too, but not always necessarily wanting to leave, but what can we do? Okay. How can we prepare yeah. the congregation? So, um, so the congregation was kind of, pardon me for jumping in, but yeah. just, it, that's kind of what, I, that's this part of what I'm interested in. So the congregation was looking to you for leadership on this. They were saying, you know, pastor, you're the theologian, you're the whatever. We're, we're, we're leaving you to lead this one. This is where you find out God has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that he actually calls idiots like us into ministry, right? Because you you're it. I mean, you're the pastor. You're the one that's being called to serve the church, to teach them and to guide them. You're the shepherd, you're the pastor. And so, like it or not, uh, you're the guy. And so, I was called to explain to the council first and foremost what does scripture say? How do how do we how do we find our way through this, you know, this this minefield of, of, of expectations and, and emotion and everything else? So we took our time, you know, and we went through, you know, before that year where I formulated those two powerful presentations and whether it, there was actually three or four years, like I said, of teaching and preparing my, you know, I would say at many times, you know, during prayer time. Pray for the LCC. Pray because this is going to happen. You know, we are not going to, the, the, the nature of this movement is not to give up. You know, and we will we need to be prepared. So, council and I went through a time of, of uh, myself equipping them first and foremost as leaders within the congregation because I can't do it by myself. I mean, you know, we equip the saints to do the work of the church. So, I would equip them and then they would then talk to others as well. Then we'd begin studies and then we let it filter down. You might say trickle down into the congregation. And then as, as you know, people went to, to conferences, they would bring back reports of what was happening and how things were happening. Not just the decisions, but how the decisions were reached. And that caused concern, which again fueled the need for more understanding and more teaching and whatnot. So it was a long and drawn out process that way. A mutual you know, discussion, hearing, answering questions. A lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, to take the time to, 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 to talk to your parishioners who have concerns, questions. Um, there's, yeah, there's still situations in my parish regarding these kinds of issues, and they're still there because precisely we are a congregation that I feel uh, is, is a welcoming, accepting, 
biblically speaking, a congregation that loves uh, each other. And so there's people who struggle, and we all struggle. Uh, and they're there uh, because they know they will be heard confidentially, and they will be loved by the people around them. But we all, without necessarily indulging the, uh, the behavior that they're struggling with. And that's what you need. That's what we need you know, from each other. Right? It's to understand and then to love each other, not to tell the truth in love. So we did a lot of studies on Bonhoeffer's book on, um, on life together. To have what's the difference between a human love and a spiritual love. You know, uh, to know the truth, but then to be able to speak the truth and love to each other. That's a hard thing for a congregation to do. And let alone as pastors who are ticked off at each other. Right? As you know, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you holy? You're a Lutheran. You know, or you're a Christian. Um, so it, it took a lot of time, um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of investment, um, emotionally and, and uh, theologically, you know, intellectually, with the people of the congregation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess one of the things that I've uh, wondered about with this whole movement, um, sort of pressure back against the leadership of, of ELCIC for some of the theological positions they've taken. Um, I think it's easy to form a broad impression that the pushback against that has come from the lay people of the church, i.e., I know I've formed this impression from various comments I've heard on various occasions that, you know, the, the, the people of the church have the common sense um, to recognize when they're being led astray. And, you know, you can trust the people of the church. They're the Berean thing from Acts, right? They check out what they're taught. They know their scripture. And so it's, it's we sort of put our, our confidence in um, the sanctified biblical and common sense of the people of the church. Um, and, and I guess that's sort of another lens of, of just getting at this and exploring this a little bit is, you know, is that actually what happened in the rise of Nauk? Um, I don't expect it to necessarily be, you know, cleanly, oh yeah, it's all that and us pastors got brought along with them, you know, or cleanly the other way either, that, you know, well, I saw this was wrong and I made up my mind at a convention and, you know, I came home and got the people to agree with this. I, I'm forming the impression that it was probably some of both. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it's some of both. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, you know, some individual pastors who were, you know, confessional orthodox in their hearts and in their minds, but didn't always have, you know, the, the backbone to stand up and, and to lead, you know, and so they needed, you know, other pastors and laity from the government to help them. Hey, don't, because there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear uh, when you go through this, you know, you know that, that you know, your own church will reject you, the people of power will reject you, you know, yeah. the cool kids won't like you, <laughs> you know, kind of the high school kind of thing with, within, within life. You know, um, and so there's a lot of pressure there, and also too, what will happen if you lose your job? I mean, all those things, and part of that was 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 self-induced. Part of it was also inculcated by the leadership sometimes, um, and by some laity, you know, who are on the opposite side of the issue. So it was just a minefield. It, it was a, it, it is still a difficult thing for a lot of these congregations, especially the smaller rural ones, that will not survive a vote. Right? Um, you know, I had one congregation, a friend of mine, and uh, what was barely not passed, but now everybody's at odds even more so, right? So it's not good. So in terms of resistance, it was both. It was pastors and laity working together. It wasn't just one or the other. To our mind in the confessional ministry, which is why we called it the confessional ministerium, is that the ministerium ought to be ones who were pastors, you know? Ought to be the ones taking leadership. Mm -hmm. That's our calling, is to lead, to preach, to teach, to guide. Uh, and if we're not doing it, then who is? Within life, and that's 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 our calling as pastors. And sometimes it's not so fun, you know. But God is always faithful. I'm not sure if that answers all your 13 questions. <laughs> that it was cluster. more to uh, try to you know I guess raise that issue to think through in terms of um, you know the application for our polity too, you know. Um, we we do I think put great trust in um, the members of the church, the laity of the church, to 
listen carefully to what the leaders of the church are teaching and saying and doing and hold them to account and correct that as necessary. Um, I think it's certainly within our polity there's kind of an inbred um, posture of, of wanting the, the congregations to do that and expecting that they will. Um, but again, that's different in different denominational families, the extent to which that's true, right? Yeah, I, I suppose so. I mean, I would, I would assume the same, but it seems to me, though, that in order for congregational members to hold their leaders to account, they actually have to know their scripture. They have to know yeah. the word. Yeah. And if they don't, mm -hmm. I mean, like the text mm -hmm. from Sunday, for instance, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 18, mm -hmm. you know, the, Paul, you know, imploring them to have unity, you know, to not be a, a, at odds with one another. You know, I'm for Paul, I'm for... You, who are you? Are you not united in Christ? Right? Mm -hmm. But they'd have to know that. They'd have to know who they are, their identity. Mm -hmm. They'd have to know the word living within them, not only within their minds, but within their hearts in Christ. And if you don't have that, it's easy to sway, you know, a congregation. And that's what we saw too many times with pastors leading their congregations down the guard path because of either for force of charisma or just being blatantly, in my mind, lying. This is what's like. That's why, for myself personally, you know, pause on the button. Is is you know when when I, when I tore apart you know the, the bishops because that's what I did is I basically dissected and said this is not what Jesus says. You know when when before you know when he says you know why do you teach in parables? Well because you, you have ears that do not hear not because you're so full of your this is my paraphrase you're so full of yourself that you cannot see Christ you cannot see the truth because when you are full of yourself can't see anything else but yourself. You have to die to yourself in order to see. Because remember the whole parable or the story of John 9. When you say you see, you're really blind. You know? In the life of the congregation, if the congregation does not know the word, then they can't see to call the leaders to account. That's why I think it was both. You have people who are very strong lay leaders, um, believers in the congregation, and they're very um, concerned. And you had pastors as well. You had a, it was an equal mix, I think, along the way. To me, though, being idealistic in some ways, I think we should be more pastors than we should be lay people, because that's what we're called to do, is to be faithful. Not necessarily successful, just faithful. So in the NALC now, I mean, we're, 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 we, we understand where we come from. You, don't, you, don't, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you come from. And so, you know, we, we, we know we've gone through this battle. We've gone through this, you know, uh, the war is won in Christ. We may have lost the battle in terms of the ELCA and ELCICs, you know, teaching and who, the way they are, you know, theologically, but we know the war is won in Christ, so that's not an issue. And we did our best, we felt we were, we were faithful as much as we could, and now we're trying to move forward uh, without repeating some of the same mistakes, you know. One, one congressional member asked me once, what makes you think that the NALC will not make the same mistake in a few years' time? I don't know. I hope not. I pray not. But the church has gone through all sorts of struggles. It's a little thing called the Reformation. <laughs> you know, 500 years. I mean, we, we can't, I don't think we, myself as a Lutheran, can be so, you know, um, uh, arrogant to think that the NLC will not make a mistake or do something stupid like this again. Maybe it's something else, another issue. I don't know. But I do know this, that when we hold each other accountable, that we love each other enough to walk beside each other and to speak the truth in love, and we always hold ourselves accountable to Christ and the Word first, and then to each other as faithful companions along the way, we have a less likelihood of being in error. That's my hope, anyway. That's why you know. That's why we. That's I guess that's why the NALC. That's my hope for it, and and being a you know central kind of body, we kind of fit. In the, anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're sure monopolizing this is becoming, all the time. Steve. I was going to say this is becoming <laughs> too much of a two-way thing. I, I keep hoping somebody else will build on something here too, but. Um, in the absence of anything else, I'm going to have another <laughs> quote here. Um, it, it seems to me that um, you know something you talked about earlier feeds in here too, and that is the theological conference. Mm -hmm. that, um, that now, NALC it has has been the organizer of that, right? No, no. okay. No, and, and, and Big that's participant in it though. Uh, it's been a participant in it. Uh, yeah. the, the one in Canada was just Carl of my idea. We did, We okay. just needed something where we can come together and get some good theology. Okay. Because the conferences yeah. in the LCIC, we felt it was not. And uh, so we needed yeah. something else. And so we, we just, this is like, as some of the guys in the United States, I said, this is Carl Phil's show. 
you know, and it, we don't call it a show for saying we, okay. it's, it's not as if it's our actor, but but rather that we felt we needed something that was lacking, mm -hmm. we needed something that was closer to Canada, and so we thought, we'd, why not? You know, um, you know, we we went over a beer once. Carl and I said, why can't we have this conference on marriage? If we were to do some of that, you know, what would you do? Who would you have? And so you start planning your dream team, right? And I thought to myself, well, why don't we phone and find out? And all five speakers came. They were all available. And that was the first one I did in 2005. Like, so you never know unless you ask. And so I thought the same thing with the theological conference. Let's just make this an open conference where anybody can come. It's, it's, it's us who are Lutheran, so it will always be Lutheran. But anybody can come and participate and have that, that acceptance, that, that unity in Christ. You know, surely we can have Christ in common, right? We say we do. So let's do that. Let's actually act. And so we did. So the NALC down in, in, in you know, the NALC as an institution did not do this, say, hey, Phil Carl would do this. They just said, hey, we like what you're doing. You're doing it already. Just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come down for the convocation where the church comes together, and the NALC would have a national synod conference, and then the synodical one on the alternate year. So you always had a conference to go to every year, whether it was synod or national. We have one every year for now. I mean, that may change because the, the church is growing and it's just, North America. Just to help people understand when he's oh, synod, synod is the equivalent of our district. Yeah. So, it means walking yeah. together. Yeah. Right? So, so we would have the same thing as, as a district meeting. So we'd have one every year. So now we have one for the time being until we change it because the size of it is going to be a source of logistical problems. And we have it every year. Last one was in, in uh, Pittsburgh. The year before that was in Columbus. Before that was in Indianapolis, I think. Um, and so. Um, they have the Lutheran core uh, group. Then you have the theological conference, which is which is which is uh, co-sponsored, I believe, by both now and the uh, Lutheran core. Then you have the convocation, all within the same week, Monday to Friday. So we come together. Now, what we're going to do in Canada, because we have our own mission district, right? As a small body, where you would have conferences here, like with the the NLCC, we have conferences. So mm -hmm. our conference mm -hmm. or mission district meeting would be the same time next year as a study conference, and that then. You know, saves you travel. Instead of having to drive or fly somewhere twice, just stay one extra day. And because we are part of one church, we don't make theological decisions here in Canada because we're part of a larger body. We do that at the convocation when we all come together. But what we can do is brainstorm together. What we can do is network together. There's all sorts of things we can do together in ministry that doesn't imply theological changes or votes or anything like that. We can just say, hey, we've got a, there's a new mission we want to do in Madagascar. What do you think? Let's work together. Right. Or how can we support our seminarians here in Canada? Let's work together. Right. That's that's one of the things I'd like to do is, is to see us as the 21 congregations, maybe you know 22 uh, February. <laughs> you know, is to how can we work together as a mission district to support our seminarians, for instance? Why should it be like the you know the the, the one the one congregation's responsibility to put their seminarian through? Though that's a good thing, but. Mm -hmm. The whole mission district should take responsibility for that. I think, I think the church should help. So why, how can we network and work together? Not just for that. That's one thing that's being brought up uh, that we'll be presenting, but there'd be a few other things too. So that's what we can do here in Canada vis-a-vis -vis going down to the States. So there's actually two theological conferences, I guess, then. One is the fun one, ours. And <laughs> they're both a lot of fun. I'm just kidding. Just that we've got a bit of a reputation for being just a little bit more relaxed up in Canada. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I mean, I joke a lot about having beer, so that would do. But I mean, it's it's not a drunk fest or anything. It's just a time just for us to get together. It's just fellowship, right? Anyway, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, getting back to um, your congregation specifically and the process that they went through. Right. <clears throat> you had mentioned that uh, you know you spent as these things came up, you would spend time in study, and that would filter down through the congregation. That, of course, is a very important thing, but. At the end of the day, when you have to actually make those, because you had to vote three times within the congregation, have three, twice? Twice. Okay. You had to meet twice and have that vote to secure the fact that you were leaving the ELCI. There's two processes we could have done. We, which we, we chose the latter. I opted, actually, I encouraged the congregation council to do the first. And that one, which is the other option, is to simply have one vote to join the NALC. Oh, okay. And now, then with the ELCC would then make the decision for us, because you cannot be rostered two different denominations, mm -hmm. is they would then make, tell us you've got a choice or get out. And say, we made our choice, we voted, get out. It'd be a lot less, I, I felt there would be less congregational you know, angst to go through that, but our, my council felt it'd be cleaner to say that this is what we decided to leave the LCC and to join the NALC. And that's okay too, that wasn't the hill I was going to die on. And so that's what so we that, did. So that was the process that you went through. At the end of the day, that was that was what all of this learning and, 
and process and meetings and everything led up to. Yes. You said that there was about 7% of the congregation that you have found that have actually left and gone wherever they've gone because of this particular process. At the end of the day, how do you, do you look at your congregation as have, being stronger from, by going through this? Or do you feel still that you're struggling a little bit in finding your footing within the end? And NLC? Yeah, no, I think we're stronger. Yeah. I, I think we're much stronger. I think we've, we've, we've seen as a body that we can actually talk about this kind of stuff without ripping ourselves apart. We, I think we, we, we went through a healthy process. And not necessarily it was without, a, without a bumps up and downs and people being, you know, saying to you in the hallway, you know, I, if we do this, I'm going to leave. And by the way, when, when I had those kinds of comments, I had like maybe four times more comments, if we don't do something, I'm going to leave, versus the one saying, if we do leave, then I'm going to leave go to another LCSC congregation. Mm -hmm. So on a practical mm -hmm. level, uh, you're going to bleed no matter what happens, right? So but for us as a congregation, I, I, I think the congregation would say that they feel stronger. Mm -hmm. Not only stronger, but closer, I would think, too. Uh, people, they know where they stand. Um, whereas before, they maybe never talked to each other about these kinds of things. Um, and it's raised other questions along the way because you—it's not just one isolated bit of theology; it's it's, it's a larger whole, right? So, uh, yeah, I think stronger. Uh, I mean, for instance, I mean, you know, it's not about money, right? It's never about money. But the year that that we before we started going through the process before we left, so it'd be two years ago. Uh, so let's say three December's ago, our annual giving in December is usually around thirty-eight, forty thousand dollars because a lot of one-time givers. That's pretty healthy, and we've never been in the red, ever. Um, so it was 40, but the year after we made the vote, so come March, and we, December comes along, first 50,000. This last year, 59,000. Um, and so, and of course, being an urban congregation, the back door is almost as big as the front door. So new people are coming in and moving in. We've lost eight people from four people, like just moving away, but other people are joining. So there's, there's, a, there's a flow. So for me to, you know, for the congregation, you know, I, what I have to do is think of is like long term, right? Not just the short term, because you can, you can easily panic in the short term sometimes. But the reality is, is that it'll take us a few years to make up, you know, the numbers and sense those thirty people. But then it's not about numbers either. It's about being faithful. God, God is faithful, right? So anyway, and you had a question. Yeah, uh, just in conversations that you and me and a few other of the confessional fellowship at that time had, as the prospects of votes came up, questions arose such as what if I desire to leave the congregation decides they don't want to leave mm -hmm. or what if the congregation decides they want to leave but I'm not sure that I want to leave uh, well, I know there have been uh, cases where uh, those tensions have arisen how have have you found a way to resolve those of pastors left without congregations or congregations left without pastors or does the pastor say whatever the congregation decides I'm your pastor and so I will abide by your decision? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> um, well a friend of mine actually he took a call to another congregation but he was in the LCIC and he felt that he could not stay in that situation um, you know forever and he'd been there for a long time a, a good long call and uh, he took his time and taught and, but it was a small rural congregation and um, yeah, it was pretty evenly divided. I mean, but probably more so. And and sometimes you have, you know, the very very much against, very much for, and then the guys in the middle who just want to like, can we just, you know, the Rodney King kind of theology? Can we just get along, kind of thing? And so they'll just do whatever it takes to just be there and just mm -hmm. continue to. And so that vote went through. And so because of that third segment, you know, it was very much just maintaining the status quo. And so um, you know, but then what happens? It's not just the vote. It's 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 the after effects, you know. Well, Pastor, now you're going to get in line now. And you know, there's those kinds of comments yeah. or those kinds uh -huh. of feelings. And so now there's even more pressure for you to conform. Yeah. And so um, so those pastors have, have moved on. Um, you know, I know a few of them. And, and all you can do is, is, is you, you know, the, I've always advised just teach your congregation. Be patient with them. Take your time. Don't lose hope to teach them. But just be found faithful. Don't just, don't just throw something out and do something quickly. Because that's not going to work either, and you're not going to do any justice to yourself, nor to the congregation, nor to the theology uh, that you espouse, right? So take your time, teach, 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 um, teach well, you know, and um, and then when nothing changes, well, then you have to make a decision, and you can't tell somebody now you should leave. Yeah. 
that's why Lutheran Core, for instance, exists. Lutheran Core is a group of uh, congregations, some, you know, uh, mostly American. Most of the ones that were in confession minister all went to the NALC or to LCC or to the CALC. The majority went to the NALC, um, well, more or less. Um, and so, um, I was going to say now. So the Lutheran Core exists as a, as a body to support those pastors and congregations who stayed within their respective bodies to be a confessional witness. But they're finding it that it's, it's getting harder and harder all the time. Because now, now that the boats have been both being one pass in a certain direction in both states and in Canada, now you're expected to conform or whatnot. And then, then what will happen in a few years' time, they're starting to realize, yeah, but when our pastor leaves and we've got to get another pastor from that seminary, uh-oh, what are we going to do now? And so that's why you say, like, any, if this is going to have effects for the next 10 years. Uh, we're going to have dribs and drabs congregations going back and forth, you know, either to NALC, LCC, or whatever. And who knows? So... Um, my mother and father-in-law actually attend Grace and Wetaska and the LCIC church there. Yeah. And one of the discussions that they have had is that, you know, for, for now it's just status quo and it's kind of like, you know, the ostrich bury the head in the sand type thing. We're not, you know, we, we believe in and hold to what we used to teach, so we're just going to continue to hold to that. But there is going to become a point, and I've kind of had conversations with a few other people around the fact that... <coughs> If the, the instant that somebody chooses out there, society has made this choice. Alberta goes the way of, of, uh, of offering that uh, the same-sex union, and they say, a couple walks to the door and says, I want to be married in your church, uh, then you have a human rights issue on your hands because you're, you are open to that. Well, but, but, yeah, but, you've, but they've uh, Grace, you know, I'm sure under Pastor Rosti, would have said, let's just take the local option. Well... And yeah, and so, the, but the congregation is under the impression that, you know, that they won't do that, and that they will hold to their little world, and they will more operate independently, although they still hold ELCIC name up front, but they will kind of operate as an independent church. This is going to come to a head eventually, uh, again, I think. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons, one of my congregation members, which we did lose, but hopefully I'm actually maybe coming back, We've caught long conversations, but you still love them, right? You still see them. Out. So, at the last, uh, the last um, town hall meeting we had, he said, "I just don't want us to be seen as, as being a, a church that discriminates by not performing same-sex." Well, why don't we just take the local option? And I said, "You realize that by taking the local option, it says that our congregation will not perform same-sex marriages." So let's at least be, have some integrity and say the reason why we're not going to have same-sex marriages is because we don't agree with the theology of this church. Either way, you're not performing same-sex marriages. Right. You're going to be seen as discriminatory, and you cannot help what people perceive you as anyway. Better for you to be perceived and known by the way you really are, by loving, you know, and welcoming people in truth, right? Not not necessarily playing politics, you know. And um, and now this person starts to say, yeah, it doesn't really make any difference because when the LCC, the Senate of Alberta, said that you could end up, now this numbers might be a little bit off, but this is what I heard from somebody who was a dean within one of the conferences. Uh, you could write a letter and saying our congregation will not perform same-sex marriages. You take the local option, right? That's what it was called. Um, only, only, only two out of the hundred and what is it, thirty-five or congregations uh, in the well, not anymore, but are left for the CLC and uh, NALC. But only two said that they would perform same-sex marriages. I think it was like thirty-four that said they wouldn't. Right? And out of those thirty-four, though, those are still within the LCC. So there's still things happening. That's why it's going to take years for this to unfold, uh, I think. Um, and Grace will have to deal with it. They can't, well, you can't. You just you have to pay the consequences of sticking your head in the sand. Yeah, right. right. And that's, that's the, that's the, you're, the pain will come sooner or later, right? It's better to get it, rip it off right now, I think. You know, at least now, before I saw hope. What else can I tell you about the NALC? Um, how we're the best church around. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah, what about There's the silence the, from the LCC uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but what about theological education? Is now going to be establishing its we own We take our stuff by correspondence or? and stuff. We don't care about theological you know, education. Just, <laughs> you know, just, we do stuff by comic books. No, uh, <laughs> 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 if we like you, we'll give you a degree. No. Uh, 
Yeah, I wish we could. No, we, we have right now, uh, we're entering into conversation. We'd be in a conversation with you guys, obviously, at Concordia. We, it's been a yes in terms of working together. We're very grateful for that. Um, we're also continuing on with the Lutheran House of Studies um, concept as well, too, until we can, you know, develop that further, maybe another direction. But for now, um, we're going to be hopefully sending more people here as well, too. Hint, hint, Eric. Um, and that's, uh, <laughs> more so. And anyway, um, but... Um, so we have a theological studies um, down in Ambridge, Pittsburgh, at the Anglican uh, Trinity, I believe it's called. Yeah. And, and, and also a court in Conwell. We're looking at having conversations with a few other places too, I think in Canada uh, at Regent, and possibly I think in Toronto, I'm not sure which one now, if it's Tyndale or uh, Trinity um, as well too. But I know that they, we very much, I had a great conversation with Don just a little while ago as well too, and I think you and I should probably have coffee one day as these two get to know each other a little bit perhaps, mm -hmm. and then see what's possible. Uh, and um, so that's what we're doing for theological education for now. There's also too the ILT, you know, um, sure. way of doing things too. For, I mean, I think that's good to some degree, but I, but I think being on, on site is better. You get to know each other, you know, support each other uh, as iron sharpens iron kind of thing, right? Have coffee together and that other beverage. So theological education, what else? I'm not sure what else I can tell you. I'm making this stuff up as I go, you know that. Um. <laughs> what do you think, um, uh, what do you think our church can learn from what you've gone through? The LCC or your yeah. congregation? The LCC? L LCC, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you yourself, you and your parish, you and the whole unfolding situation in the ELCIC that has led up to this. Um, again, I guess that partly depends on how well you know our church. I was just going to say that. I mean, well, that you know, <laughs> <laughs> but what are the what are the things you you learned that that might be applicable? You know, I, I, that's a really good question. I, I think that. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I came into the fold as a Roman Catholic, be converted by my Lutheran wife into the EOCIC at Emmanuel Lutheran in the Stony Plain in '85, um, and then been part of the EOCIC since then. Uh, and all my relationships—I was just telling Don this—that uh, all my relationships with the LCC has been wonderful. It's been excellent. Some of my closest friends. Yeah. Almost sounds like one of those. Some of my closest friends are LCC. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, but, but in all truth, it is. I mean, Wolf and Dorothy McGinn from Stony Plain, or Spruce Grove, I mean, when I was a youth worker at Emmanuel, they came over and they wanted to talk to me as a youth worker, like, what makes your youth group successful? How come you're doing so well? How can we learn from you? And then we started doing countercult ministry together, and they bought me, like, a couple of my commentary sets are from them. They supported me there through seminary, you know, wonderful. Um, I came here, almost became seduced by the by the pizza and by the pop when this place was first built when I was at King's College in 89 to 90. And I remember you were on a prospect list. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was, it, was, it was very close, <laughs> you know. But I made this promise, you know, like, so I loved it. Right. <laughs> it was, it was, it was uh, yeah, I mean, it's, so I mean, all my relationships have been very, very good within the, with the LCC church. I guess my, my only thought is, is that we each have to be careful uh, to not think that we know everything along the way. I think the LCC has made that mistake in their own way, and I think uh, I hope the NALC avoids that as well. And, and I, my, my, my hope is too is that the LCC may you know uh, you know remain open you know uh, to, because we have much. Of, that's what I love about the the STS, the Society for the Holy Trinity. You know, uh, meaning it's, it's a it's a pan Lutheran body. It's a prayer society, a ministerial. We support each other. Going back to the confessions, right, and and uh, and um, anchoring ourselves in Scripture and in the liturgy of the church, and in prayer for one another and also for the unity of the Christian Church. You know, remembering our history, you know, um, and where we came from. And so there, there's 14 different stripes of Lutherans. We have incredible conversations, uh, incredible arguments, and yet we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, um, which is why we call you know the STS the Scotch and Tobacco Society. You know, <laughs> uh, rather than Society Sancte, right? You know? So I mean, it's you know, it, it, but there you have that acknowledgement that uh, you're not the only kind of Lutheran out there. You know, and, and so we can learn from each other. 
That's what I would hope, is that we never remain closed off from learning from each other. And how much we have to share. We have far, far, far more in common than we have differences. And, and that's, that's, that's why Carl and I, you know, that's, as long as we're planning this conference, and it's ours, it will be that kind of conference as much as we can. Uh, barring we make a bad pick one day and we get a wacko, you know, but, <laughs> but so far so good, you know, because we listen to other people, right, other Lutherans, uh, scholars who say, you should call that person. So I read uh, Simonetto's book on the fabricated Luther, and I'm like, gosh, what a great book. You know, so he's going to be coming, and, and he's going to talk a little bit about that book, too, a little bit, and uh, some other things. Um, so, yeah, listening, learning. You know, because I mean, along the way, you know, in terms of the process of going through this whole past unpleasantness, uh, and I don't say unpleasantness because of the people, uh, you know, it was because, you know, my wife and I are having an argument once in a while, you know, and, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I wish we weren't in this place, you know. Um, you're wrong, obviously, but I still wish we weren't in this place, <laughs> and she hits me, you know. Um, but, but I wish, you know, that, that in, the, in, in the going through the past unpleasantness, you learn a lot about yourselves, about how sometimes you're an idiot. You know, uh, not the other person, but you, you are an idiot because you hold to these things so firmly that you forget. And sometimes we see in our argumentation the politics and the theology, not just the person. We miss the person. And that's what we learned along the way. And so we have much still to learn. You know, we can be theologically correct, but if we have no love, well, what does St. Paul say about that? Right? So uh, I, I think that's a real thing for us to remember and to stand upon and to hold to as the center of our faith, you know, is the love of God in Christ. You know, so to, to remain open to listening and to walking together. Um, yeah. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, Murphy had a dog. And, uh, <laughs> and he'd go nowhere without that dog. And that dog uh, was a beautiful Irish wolfhound. And one day, Patrick came out from the bakery and says, Murphy, where's your dog? And he says, oh. You never see without the dogs. What happened to the dog? He says, I had to put him down. He says, why was he bad? He says, well, he wasn't too pleased. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a strategy. And anyway, that's... A, <laughs> I could tell you more Irish jokes too, but I have to tell them off camera. Um, <laughs> but that wastes another minute. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, you know, how do I say, um, questioning what else I can tell you about the NALC. A um, lot of hopes for the church. Uh, we're a growing church, like I said, so there's lots of things we're learning. Um, we're trying to things, to, and there's things obviously we want to unlearn, because we come from our backgrounds of the LCIC and the LCA. And so there's things that we've carried with us, obviously. Uh, things we want to change, which is why then sometimes when they'll say, so what is the role of provisional dean, let alone a dean, right? What's the role of the dean, per se? See, so the first question I asked the bishop I said, when I was appointed, I said, so where's the handbook? He goes, there is no handbook. <laughs> uh, who's going to make a handbook? So at the last dean's meeting, I volunteered to write the handbook. Uh, so there's, there's an implicit understanding in a sense, because we have deans of conferences, but this is not quite the same thing. Right? The, the dean is, a, is, a, is an extension of the bishop's office, and so we, we do the same kinds of things, but we're not like the, the heavy. Right? We're more of the person, or the facilitator, the one who points back to scripture and tries to facilitate reconciliation, to encourage and to teach, and to remind people of you know, who they are as Lutherans, as Christians. Right? So the dean, um, you know, so that whole you know manual or idea, that's not being written yet. So there's a lot of things we're in a process, you might say, of writing, you know, in the life of the NALC. So that's why you know I'm not sure exactly what I can tell you. There's not stuff I can talk about, but I guess if you ask me the right question. So we go drinking about once a week, by the way, <laughs> for a beer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Gary was quite clear on that. So. Oh, Gary was quite clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Gary. I mean, you guys knew Gary, right? So Gary, Gary and I took Hebrew together. Oh, excellent. So uh, we would meet for tea at the uh, at the Christie's Corner there once a week. And at Toy Aromas or. Uh, no, the bubble, bubbles, bubbles tea palace. Oh, I thought tea was like sort of like a you know tea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually had tea. Okay. <laughs> you're a Lutheran, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, you're stu when you're studying Hebrew, though, beer doesn't go well. No, it doesn't go well. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Now, when I went to ELCIC to seminary, uh, beer I found quite helpful. So, I was just kidding. <laughs> yes. This kind of goes a little bit off of it. 
the amount, but uh, I'm just curious, where does this leave the ELCIC? Like, in, in terms of trying to understand uh, Canada in particular and the denominations that have been strained, you know, what are their numbers looking like? Um, mm. And what their constituency, you know, the people that are supporting this particular move in Canada? Mm. Good, good question. Well, our numbers have dropped, you know, considerably in terms of congregational members from like, I think it was like 220 a few years ago to like 140, 150 now. So we dropped quite a bit. You saw the same thing happen in the United Church of Canada in 1988. They lost like 40% of their membership since then. Excuse me, it's, it's been very difficult for them as well too. Uh, congregationally in terms of numbers, um, well, we have 21 in the NALC. Uh, the CALC went from 5 to 27, so that's not the 22, so that's 43. And I know that there's been others have gone to the LCC, that's the numbers I don't have, and you guys won't tell me, so I'm just kidding. Uh, I, actually, <laughs> actually, at least in Alberta, I, I'm only aware of uh, Dixon is the one, okay. uh, one congregation that's, that's come. I'm not aware of any, mm -hmm. any I, I, others. We, we have a couple of pastors, Peter Van Catwick oh, and, yeah, and Randy, Randy Figge. Randy Figge yeah. Look, and uh, you also have two Norm Miller. Oh, Norm, of course. Right. Yeah, but yeah, Norm Miller. Mm -hmm. And also Greg Jones. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, but those are pastors, right? not necessarily the congregation. So yeah. I would say probably about 50, give or take, to be it's a safe number. Uh, that went, that some of them went independent, right? And some of them, um, I, aside from that, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. Even when we wanted to have certain things, like when we wanted to give information to delegates, to the, the national office wouldn't tell us who they were or whatever would you know distribute anything because they just did not want to give us any kind of uh, aid, uh, power, knowledge. So if I asked them right now, so how many congregations? Do you? They're not telling you anything. You know, I'm pretty sure it'd be the answer. So I think I, I think a guesstimate of maybe around 50, 55 congregations all the way through. Uh, yeah. From 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 the national, we have from about from about 600. Now somebody else has said 75 at one point, but I, and I think that was just a sheer wild guess, because when you add up the numbers, it doesn't quite make 75. But maybe they know something I don't. So. What I do know is that congregation, the main thing is right now you're seeing loss within the LCC, not necessarily in terms of congregations for now, because there's quite a number of things happening all at the same time. Uh, and it's all gonna flesh itself out in the next you know, five to 10 years. And that's just congregational members saying, you know what, I, what I'm, I'm leaving. And I hear people going to uh, other Lutheran churches, others going to Pentecostal churches, going down to the church on the street, the mega church around the corner. Uh, they're all over the place. And so, you know, they're, they're just losing members, not necessarily a congregation uh, as well. So that's all part of the mix, which is, which is really, you know, really sad. Because you know, you'd, you'd want to have, you know, your congregation members stay. You know, if you feel that strongly that you're going to leave, then stay and make a difference. At least in my mind, anyway. You know, just leave. It's too easy to leave. You know, I mean, <laughs> we left for the end. You know, but I mean, it's too easy to leave a congregation, and, and that's why we didn't leave when we first, you know, first signed a trouble, so you know, 13, 15 years ago. You gotta, you gotta do what you can until you know there's nothing left you can do. Right. Well, maybe the congregation members have. Most of the people I felt that I talked to have not. They just had enough and just pastored this or whatever, and so you end up leaving. That's why I think that, it's, that we haven't lost like 80,000 people through death. You know, it's been a lot through just transferring one up. Yes, sir. So, so John and Martha are, um, they're interested in joining a Lutheran church, but they're being visited by an LCC pastor and by an NALC pastor, both on separate occasions go to the home. How would you describe to John and Martha, um, from your perspective, some of the differences between those two congregations, or, or what might help them make a decision which church to join? Hmm. Uh, what I would focus on, I mean, is, is that uh, uh, that we're those four values that we hold to it now. That we're Christ-centered. We hold to the Word of God as fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. Inerrant, infallible in, in that sense. Um, it's the only rule and norm for our doctrine and, and our values in life. Uh, we live our life by. Um, 
we hold to uh, the teaching of the great tradition, you might say, is found in the Lutheran Church, all those kinds of things. I wouldn't focus on the things that separate us. I wouldn't focus on those things, you know, the big three, you know, or the big two or whatever, uh, you know, women's ordination or things like that. I would just focus on those. Because for me, those things are, are not necessarily the big thing. And even the one on close communion, we are so close in really our understanding of how we practice it, right, Ed? You know, that we've talked about, that it's it's not that much difference. It's really the big one is like women's ordination. Right? That's the thing. And we're in conversation about all of what that means over maybe for quite a while. <laughs> you know, and that doesn't mean we have to come to agreement. So for me, that's not even an issue. I wouldn't even bring that up in, in, in a meeting, per se. I would just talk about, you know, who we are in Christ, that we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, uh, Lord of all, um, and that the LCC is very similar to us. And, you know, my main thing is that if a congregational member, a person who I was talking to um, was asking me about what is important, I'd say that you follow Christ wherever he's preached. You hold to the scriptures, you hold to Christ, cling to him wherever you may find him. And whether it's an LCC congregation or a Pentecostal congregation or wherever, uh, ours, praise be to God. And if you find yourself at home, you know, and, and uh, or a home, and because hopefully they're probably not just talking to you, right? They probably have visited the congregation, they've come and talked to you, and that's usually what happens in my case. And we get to know each other a bit. And then we'll talk about you know, the LBW, you know, the liturgy and, and uh, stuff like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Not a follow up, but um, so what can the LCC, what can CLS do to be the best fraternal partner with you in, in um, achieving your goals in the ministry? Keep knowing where we stand mm -hmm. and knowing where you stand. I, I think that the main thing, you know, like, is a Steve and I were talking about it. I think the main thing is that, is that we, we listen to each other and we try to accept each other you know, for who we are. And I think as, as a seminary, I said, do what you're doing well. Teach. Teach well. Hold the scripture well. Hold the, you know, to the teaching of the church well. Um, knowing who we are, you know, um, you know, as NALC, that we're so close, it's ridiculous. You know, um, and, and so uh, accept us. You know, for who we are, that we have Christ in common. You know, Broughton said something a while back, and I don't know how you guys think about Broughton or anything else, because I never actually made a poll, per se. But I thought he said something really interesting, and I'm still trying to flesh out, you might say, in my own mind. And he said this at, the, uh, at a study conference once, and he said, if we have Christ in common, surely we can commune together. You know, because I think about that. You know, like, you know, we have Christ in common. We have Christ in our hearts, but we may not have him in our mouths together. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, I, maybe that's oversimplifying. I'm not sure it is oversimplifying things. But if we can have Christ in common, then we can listen to each other. We can walk together. Maybe we can't have communion yet, or as I understand, maybe we can now because of the circumstances here. But for me, that's my goal, not just for the seminary, but not my goal, my hope, because I'm not in, one in politics like that. So, not a Machiavellian kind of thing. <laughs> this is my goal. I shall take over. But rather, <laughs> but that's my hope. Is that like Broughton said in a very simple way, and it is simple, you know. And I know that life is more complicated. Theology has its little, you know, ins and outs and everything else. And obviously, but surely to God, if we can have Christ in common, then we can have Him in common, you know. And and so that's my hope, right? is to recognize that one thing at least at this point. If we have Christ in common, then let's let's treat each other like we do. And, and, and I think we're well on our way to doing that. You know, and so, so on, a, on the academic part, do what you do well. That's why we're sending you our students. You know, and we'll be sending you our students. It's because of that. Right? Not just because you're a Lutheran face on the map or dating, but, but you know, that, that you are here and you're all established and this is a good place. You know, that's my hope is to send as many of our students here as possible. Unfortunately, I, I mean, the reality is I have to have students to send you. But when that starts <laughs> happening, <laughs> then I will be sending them, right? I mean, Got one of them right there. You have Gary Brower before that, you know. And as and as it becomes more well known and more established, and as we continue maturing and growing, that's my whole like we're going to see what I'm talking about. It's all about timing, right? I know the struggles that you guys are having, you know, Waterloo and this, and just students and everything else. I mean, you know, God willing, and creeks don't rise. You know, maybe hopefully we can work together, you know, to produce something really good. Probably a rambling, kind of ambiguous, vague, constant statement. But But that's political speech, right? <laughs> uh, 
I've got a lot of hopes, but not always a lot of content. <laughs> well, that, that strikes me as a good place to draw things together, I guess, and uh, as well as the clock on the wall indicating that we're at that time. But um, thank you very much. And uh, how about if we close with prayer? Okay. Sure. For you and your fellowship and us great. and ours. Um, and thanks for what we've had a chance to think about today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word, which comes to us and plants new life as we are drawn toward Christ our Savior. Thank you that you sent him for the whole world and that we in our shared Lutheran tradition have um, received that treasure of the gospel and been able to steward it, to probe its depths, to extend it outward through our mission work, down through time and across um, many regions of the world. Thank you that we are heirs together with our brothers and sisters in the North American Lutheran Church of, um, of that strong gospel and that we can um, celebrate the many things that we've received in common from you. Help us keep the conversation going and help us continue listening to one another so that we can find those areas of agreement and um, support one another. Um, Lord, you know the, the great missional opportunities that face this generation and generations to come. We thank you for all who have offered themselves for formation in the pastoral ministry, um, especially those who are here in our midst at this seminary, from LCC, from NALC, um, from wherever. We give you thanks for those people and the students represented here today among them, and pray that you would bless them in Christ's service. Help us together to always draw sustenance from your word to find it as our anchor, to cling to it, and probe its depths, and take it increasingly to heart. Um, for all the opportunities we have to do that, including the conversation we've shared here today, we give you thanks and praise. We put ourselves in your care for the rest of this day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, I think if you have individual questions or Time for more conversation, and we have a bit of an opportunity for that anyway. Oh, so, sure, we have got time. So. Yeah, well, it's close. Well, thanking Pastor Bill.